it's 12.59, so I just want to check my mic one more time. Could you let me know if y'all hear me okay? I can hear you. Wonderful, thank you. So when you check out YouTube, be sure to subscribe to the VWEC channel to be notified of all the excellent content that is continually being added there. Before I introduce our guests, I'd like to tell you a little bit about VWECs. Let me catch up with my speakeasy. I'm so sorry. I'd like to tell you a little bit about VWECs modules of teaching. Modules of Teaching exhibit is located here at the Eduverse Plaza, and I've gone ahead and sent you a link to that, a slur for that. Expert instructors, including our panel today, who have used virtual worlds as a technology to teach their classes, have created this exhibit to share their approaches and why they chose that approach. These classroom experiences are diverse in content and include K-12, higher ed, and eventually lifelong learning instructors. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our guests. Our first guest today is Zinnia Zaber, who is Renee Excuse me. Our first guest today is Zinnia Zaber, who is Renee Amico Brock, a professor at Peninsula College. She is an artist, instructor, and superhero, empowering people to be at their best virtual and tangible self. Renee has taught college level fine arts and digital media since 1997 and started teaching in virtual worlds in 2008. Renee earned her Bachelor's of Science in Art at Lewis and Clark College and her Master's of Fine Arts at Vermont College in Fine Arts at Norwich University and is the 2020 recipient of the VWPEE Thinker Award. So, welcome Zinnia. Empowering people to be at their best virtual and tangible self. Renee has taught college level fine arts and digital media.
I'm sorry, I thought you were introducing everyone. <laughs> That's why I wasn't saying anything. I'm so sorry, would you like to go ahead and, and start or I can I can introduce everyone and then you can each speak. Uh, I'm sorry, I was thinking you were introducing everyone on the panel first. That's why I wasn't saying anything. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and introduce everyone. Our second speaker today is going to be Medi Martian, who is Dr. Eric Moore, the Executive Director over Cybersecurity and Data Centers at a large suburban school district. He teaches cybersecurity at the graduate level at Regis University in Denver and is Editor-in-Chief at the Journal of the Colloquium for Information Systems Security Education and chair of the IFIP World Information Security Conference. His 3D education builds in virtual worlds have supported higher education and K-12 programs within the U.S. and abroad. While his PhD is in cybersecurity and he holds a master's degree in telecommunications, his first graduate degree is a master of fine arts, working as a professor of fine arts for about 10 years, teaching commercial and fine arts in both digital and traditional media. His peer-reviewed cybersecurity research works to understand and enhance the lives of those who work, learn, and live in cyberspace with an emphasis on cyber defense teams. Welcome Eric today. Thanks very much, Brayla. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Our next speaker today will be Matt, Max Chat Noir. Let me get my get caught up here. <laughs> Max Chat Noir is Dr. Mary Ann Clark, a retired biology instructor at Texas Wesleyan University, who manages Genome Island in Second Life. She taught biology for about 50 years and came into Second Life in 2004 looking for an immersive place to teach biology online. She had little experience in programming and no experience in building. Starting with a small parcel on the Second Life mainland, she eventually moved to what is now Genome Island. She moved her online non-majors course to Second Life in 2007 and soon as, her, as soon as her university got computers that could run the browser and she encourages other educators to take advantage of virtual worlds for teaching. Welcome, Max. Thank you, Brayla. I'm so happy to be here. Fiona Destiny is Dr. Doris Molero, a language professor at Universidad San Pablo Tucumán. She has been developing ways of teaching English and Spanish for more than 30 years. Doris is passionate about language learning, instructional design, and related educational technologies, specifically multi-user virtual environments for situated experiential learning. She's part of Webheads in Action and TESOL, both important worldwide communities of language language educators. She has been part of the Virtual Worlds MOOC and Evil Village online training sessions as a moderator, creating courses for English teachers in Second Life and Kitely. This year, they also explored VR platforms such as Frame VR, Mozilla Hubs, and Altspace VR. And she is the recipient of the 2022 VWP BPE Thinkerer Award. Welcome, Peonia. Thank you. Happy to be here. Besitos. <laughs> and then finally, Kaylee West is Dr. Scott Grant a lecturer in Chinese language and culture at Monash University and creator of the Chinese Island Immersive Learning Environment in Second Life. You can find her in the universes of OpenSim, Defiance, Star Citizen, Tom Clancy's The Division, Arma 3, and VR Chat. 
She's particularly interested in the use of digital technology and ICT to enhance learner experiences. Her current focus is on virtual worlds, VR and AR, and developing educational simulations that complement more traditional cur curriculum, both classroom-based and online. Her PhD thesis is called Getting Immersed in Chinese Task-Based Language, Learning in a 3D World Simulation. Kaylee very much wanted to be here today, but she is in Australia, and so she's unable to join us. However, she's been extremely helpful to us as we've set up, and she is sending us information with you. Uh, she has a video available with more details that is at the Mo Models of Learning Center, and she sent us a presentation that I will be sharing with you. So with that, Zinnia, if you would like to go ahead and begin. Yes, thank you. So I am trying to advance my slides and these slides and see if I can find mine um, because you all know how I have to make things pretty. Um, thank you so much for having me today and this opportunity to be showcased with a number of wonderful profession professionals. We um, all work in very different ways, and so well, I don't see my slides. So I'm, I see a lot of other ones. So I will start <laughs> with what I was going to say. So I'm using the speakeasy as my script as well. And don't worry, I'm not going to sing this part, but I'm sure you all know the lyrics of Pure Imagination. So I make technology accessible and teach art to facilitate inquiry, innovation, and exploration. My courses are listed as multimedia communications and art, and yet I teach teamwork, confidence, creativity, and a bit of physics and philosophy. Which means I guide students to use their imagination to produce inspiring content and develop persuasive and visually attractive media that communicates information, welcomes engagement, and educates. Oh, thank you for buttoning up the slide for me. Yay. At Peninsula College, I am the Multimedia Communications Program Coordinator as well as the Business and Information Technology Division Chair, which means I get to teach students from all different forms of pursuits and interests. My Peninsula College students live all over the world and we are online and on campus. We have had online education degree seekers for over two decades. I live in a pretty remote location on the Olympic Peninsula near the most northwest spot in the state of Washington. The moment I finally got high speed internet, I signed up for Second Life to expand my reach and the opportunity to learn a new set of skills. I bet a bunch of you did that too. Yes, I am lucky that my college administrator supported me in teaching this virtual education environment. I've had amazing campus IT team and stellar students who advocate to learn in the future. Playing is learning. I build complex layered learning systems that provide a map, itinerary, set of clear guidelines and outcomes, call to action, and visual language. Let me see if I can, oh, there we go. There's a good example of a couple of those systems to make these complex ideas accessible, and they are pretty, playful, and colorful, and very brain bright. Content creation and curation in virtual worlds ties into every skill set that my students explore, like Photoshop, video production, 3D building, digital storytelling, and those soft skills like working with clients and presenting projects. Students work as teams and the low cost and low risk makes them courageous. Working in virtual worlds is also given them access to other instructors and students for teaching and learning experiences. And because it's my students, they will do the teaching. <laughs> so a little bit about the exhibit that you will explore. Let me switch back here. Awesome. To find your difference with the low star compass model exhibit encourages the learner to do what they love. 
Limitless ambition essentials include a lodestar, your passion compassion, your passion compass that you use as your unique guide and as a point of navigation. So originally when I was going to do this, I was dressed in red to be your red arrow pointer on the compass. And then we realized I was going to blend into the carpet too much. So <laughs> I changed my outfit. So I hope that it still allows you to guide, be guided. To motivate students and colleagues to define and refine their own pursuits and interests as an imperative goal pointer within this extraordinary educational directive and journey. So, so much of what I do is to develop spaces so that students can explore and use their skills and build up their skills. The Lodestar also embraces persuasive storytelling and effective communication with an influential introduction, challenge, and resolution to articulate unconventional and exceptional job skills. Immersive environments provide occupational navigation practice and fortitude. Discover and use your own Lodestar. It provides transformational experience to boost communication and to reveal motivation to place people with you to, to where you want to work with and who and in those roles that you love and offer them unlimited energy and purpose. I suspect a lot of you also realize how virtual worlds are a transformative experience for our students. Do you agree? Through the Lodestar lesson, you can define what you love, explore our objectives to define your purpose, to fuel up for your drive that gives you energy, to express what you enjoy as you are fully engaged, to communicate these storytelling elements, to share skills and accomplishments. You can define your situation, and this is your observed and explained status that task is the mission at hand and action is the effort and achievements. The result is the ideal outcome. Some of you may have explored builds or other uh, presentations with my coursework and how I motivate students by learning more and giving them a mission to support others. The Superheroes Journey, which is a new student orientation digital storytelling interactive project, is ongoing persistent engagement experience that inform and inspire new students. My students design, build, and institute components of this superheroes journey. The continual goal of the project is to build an innovative marketing space and introduce to the two students what college is through this adventure. Throughout the creative production and iterative design learning systems, these steps are to play, discover, document, design, develop, deploy, update, and reflect, and to have students work together. And sometimes they need to repeat and these things to make it better. A sense of space creates a sense of belonging. Open exploration is wonderful and providing them a pathway assures them that they will find their way. Students want to contribute. Virtual worlds provide a path away from the ordinary to the extraordinary. What will you discover on our pathway? And I'll stop there so I can let some other people share their stuff too. Thank you so much, Zinnia. That was outstanding, really interesting, very colorful. <laughs> Mehdi, if you would like to go ahead and continue. Okay, thanks very much. Yes, uh, uh, Zinni, I really uh, appreciated the involvement of your students and the uh, uh, the way you use the graphics. I think I need to work on that in my own work. So, uh, 
I'll go ahead and uh, show it here. This is a, a virtual world data center. You can see me standing there for a sense of scale. And um, what I'm doing is um, offering students the ability to experience a professional role. And the professional role here is as a physical security auditor. So students will uh, come to the virtual data center. This is at Vertex. So if they're uh, down on the surface, they can take the teleport up and then follow the arrows they get here. And then they read the signs for what are their responsibilities and requirements. This um, exercise is used at different schools. So uh, the professor may have different requirements for the students but how they actually do the work are listed on these placards here in front. Once they have that, then behind them is this scenario space surrounded by the blue wall. It's the building, but it's also the surrounding space. Students have to go in and identify what's wrong with the space, what could be improved, what are security risks. And uh, as we deal with virtual worlds, the reason this was done in a virtual world is because 9-11 occurred and uh, so this was actually built quite a long time ago. And uh, when that happened, I had been giving tours and other people had too of uh, data centers for their students to uh, do physical security auditing live to say, you know, what's where are the security flaws in this data center? How could they improve access controls? Do they have operation security? Are they uh, protecting their data and processes? And are they protecting the uh, data on the servers and drives and things like that physically as they should? So there's a lot of things going on here that we can see. Initially, um, you can't see really close in these diagrams, but if you look, there's a little payphone near the stairs there on the lower left in the front door or next to the front door. Well, having a payphone next to a front door of a secure installation is just ask, giving a person an excuse to come up and loiter near your security entrance. And so this would be one type of thing that the students would need to find. But it's really not about things, and it's not about words so much, and it's also not about just a particular view. But physical security auditing is particularly three-dimensional. It's a spatial skill. It's like as you walk up the steps, can you recognize that the proximity of the phone next to the um, stairs and the entrance is inappropriate. Hey, I just realized, and I'm sorry about this, but I forgot to share the link to the um, auto text chat. So let me go ahead and put that uh, in the chat here so you can have that for this presentation. Hopefully that will work. Uh, now, uh, as, as we're looking a little closer at this uh, scale, we can see that there are other buildings around there and maybe shipping containers behind it. Students will discover that learning about what is around your data center can equally affect your security. So they have to take a walk like any physical security auditor would. When they're doing this, they really get the experience and they have to define two um, columns one is, what would the security risk be? And the second one is, how would you correct that risk? While the students don't necessarily have a great deal of experience at answering these types of questions, it gives them the sense for what the responsibilities would be in the role and what types of things they can start to uncover. And then in their class, when they debrief, then they can uh, review this, they can compare with other students and uh, see what's happening. This is the entrance, and uh, as you can see here, immediately there is a, a staff directory right on the desk as you walk in. Uh, and while, while the staff directory is a good thing, the um, having it sit on the front desk is not necessarily mm -hmm. a good thing. So uh, students can uh, see the... Um, staff directory there, but then they should be also thinking something like what what is the uh, what could happen if the staff directory is sitting there? What kind of scenario can occur that might incur risk? This particular um, uh, form here, this uh, person sitting behind the desk is not an avatar. 
Uh, we don't have it set up as a chat bot right now because the facility just moved, but you can also chat with some of the um, characters in the scene so that you can uh, get a sense for what's going on there. And uh, then also you see there's a metal detector. Is this the right place for the metal detector? Should there be some sort of other um, in entryway, something like that? But uh, it's a way of confirming uh, the people going into the computer rooms of the data center. Um, you can see there's a copy machine and other things like that around that all come into question. Should people be looking at the a video of the security cameras or should they not? There aren't necessary. I mean, there are some really obvious things, but there are a lot of physical security auditing questions that are ambiguous. And so having the students role play this out provides a rich environment that's now, because of higher security requirements, difficult to actually provide to the students in a real world scenario. And yet doing this, they still get the same spatial recognition, spatial pattern identification, and other things like that. So um, if you uh, want to uh, go visit this site, you can uh, go over to the uh, model build on this sim, and there's a, a link to the uh, landmark so that you could go visit the site over at Vertec. All right, thanks very much. Thank you so much. That was really cool. I would love to go see that. Max, would you like to join us? I would. And I'm going to be pasting some text in here as I go, and I will try not to get too confusing about it. So I think that many of you know that what first brought me into Second Life was playing World of Warcraft with my husband, who was a, a, um, an intrepid gamer. Um, and when I played that game with him, I discovered how how, Im how uh, educational those environments were. You had to learn how to do stuff in order to play the game. And so that's that's how I got into Second Life to begin with and found that, oh, I can, I can build stuff here. I can build laboratories and stuff. So the structure of Genome Island, which is where I taught my non-majors genetics course for 14 years, is meant to be kind of a virtual laboratory where students can run experiments and test various hypotheses um, about genetics or to see how you know a lot of the principles of genetics have emerged. Uh, the island is open access, so students from any place can, uh, can come in and use it. Um, and this next part is where I should have learned something from Zinnia, but I didn't. So I'm just going to leave it right where it is and tell you a little bit about the structure of the island. So there are several regions, and each of the regions is associated with a particular aspect of genetics. Um, in Mendel's Abbey and the Associated Gardens, uh, these help students to learn the Mendelian laws. They can do different experiments, and we'll see one of those in a little while. Um, and then in the outlying regions, like the Cattery and some of the other places that are near the Abbey, there are extensions to the Mendelian laws. Um, in the tower is most of the molecular genetics, including information on uh, gene and chromosome structure, information and experiments on gene and chromosome structure. There is a bioinformatics platform where we can do historical genetics and bioinformatics. And um, in the, there are a bunch of galleries for both prokaryotic and eukaryotic and organeller genomes. And uh, those are informational resources for various, uh, various prokaryotic and eukaryotic genomes. 
And then finally, there are a lot of places on the island where you can meet. And one place where I often start out is at this Abbey conference table that you can see in the slide there. And this, um, I usually use this for the orientation session, which is the only time I really meet directly with the students as a single group. Uh, I'm, in a, I'm in and out of the island a lot, just kind of keeping up with their work and answering questions and so forth. But for orientation, uh, I get to get, get the students together in several small groups uh, and make sure they, they knew how to get around the island and how to interact with the objects and that sort of thing. So there are three kinds of um, exhibits around the island. Some of them are just, uh, well, some of them are just, are these meeting places. In fact, if you look through the door, you can see, you can possibly just see another little little table that's way down at the end by, uh, by the gene pool. And so there are several other uh, meeting places, and they're all out of uh, chat range with one another, so that several, several groups can meet at the same time on the island. The Human Chromosome Gallery is an example of some of the informational, uh, some of the informational exhibits on Second Life. So these chromosomes are all to scale. That is, that's the, the, the relative sizes of the chromosomes are the real relative sizes, except for the mitochondrial genome, which is that circle that you see in the back. That is, of course, much bigger. But all the other chromosomes are, uh, are modeled to scale. And each of the chromosomes will tell you something about itself. It will give you its size and, and uh, how many genes it has uh, so that students can calculate the gene densities. Each of the chromosomes also talks about one of the genes that is on the chromosome. Um, and that, um, that is explained in a note card that you get if you click on the chromosome. And then the arrows that you see on the different chromosomes show the location of the gene that is described for that chromosome. So this is just information. There aren't any real experiments that are involved in this particular display. And the, uh, the various genomes are similar. They'll tell you something about a particular genome, dog, cat, horse. Um, or various kinds of bacteria and so forth. So this is this is just um, just an informational resource. A lot of the exhibits on Genome Island are interactive and allow students to uh, to run experiments, and so they can see uh, the kind of thing that they would see if they were doing uh, live experiments in a laboratory. The advantage of doing them um, in, in this, um, the advantage of doing them as, as a simulation is that you don't have to wait for two weeks for the flies to hatch or nine weeks for the kittens to get born or any of those things. You can see the, uh, the results of the experiments right away. And for example, this is, uh, this is an experiment from the Dye Hybrid Garden. And um, there are um, two different kinds of, uh, of genes represented here, uh, one for height and one for color. And so you can get tall red, short red, tall white, and short white. And uh, the numbers beside each of the pictures, each of the pictures shows you a possible result of uh, clicking on the garden and getting a population of these flowers. Um, and the predicted numbers are 93 to 3 to 1, 9 tall red to 3 short red to 3 tall white to 1 short white. And as you can see, uh, you never get just exactly that with a single progeny set. If you run a lot of progeny sets and then you take the average of them, you get much closer to those predicted numbers. Uh, which shows the importance of getting large, large data numbers for, for doing data analysis. 
Uh, let me just, I'm just going to put something else in the chat record here. Okay. So this is another example of, uh oh, oh what happened? There it is. Um, this is actually one of the one of the uh, interactive objects that's on display in the uh, in the in the learning model center here on Edgeverse, and uh, this is about blood typing. This is an example of one of those things that don't quite follow the Mendelian laws because there are there aren't just two possible uh, blood types. There are three possible blood types. And two of them are dominant to the other one. Um, and so what you have here on this table is uh, the progeny of four possible mothers. Uh, the mother, the blood type of the mothers is shown in the circles on each of the posters. So we have a type O mother, a type A mother, a type B mother, and a type AB mother. Um, and if you click on any of these posters, you will get possible progeny that this mother could produce, depending, of course, on who the father was. So from, uh, and, and then uh, you click on these slides and you run a blood typing test. And uh, so you can see what the blood types are for the progeny. Um, and this poster up near the back, up, up above the table, shows how to read the, read the test. And so you get blood types for the progeny, and you have the blood type from the mother. And so the task is to figure out what the blood type of the father might have been. And there are several different sets of progeny that can be, that can be produced from each of the mothers. Um, and in some cases, the father may be more than one possible blood type. But I just asked the students to pick any possible paternal blood type. And then they have to figure out what the genotypes of the mother and the father and all of the project are from the data that they have here. So there's a lot of uh, this, this activity can, can take a while to work all the way through it. So the other activity that is in the uh, teaching models exhibit is the cattery, which is uh, actually another example of uh, divergence from uh, the, the simple Mendelian laws. Because this one, uh, the cattery shows you about uh, six linked genes. So in the, in the exhibit, um, there are uh, there are videos which uh, take students around the table. You are welcome to, of course, uh, go and look at that any time. Uh, and there are also uh, some information about other, other aspects of the island. And I think I will just uh, stop there and pass it on to Peonia. Thank you so much, Max. Peonia, you're up. Thanks, Max. Wow. Well, as you can see, lots of experiences and lots of really good things can be done in virtual worlds. So to tell you a little bit about my experience and how I got here, well, that was back in 2006, thanks to uh, Web Heads in Actions. So they used to be very enthusiastic and have a, a a center in, in Second Life, but at that time I didn't have a good computer or connection or anything. So I had to wait until 2009 and then the first thing that I I got the chance to explore was role playing in a fantasy sim. So for a, a language teacher that was like, wow, you know, this is a great way to teach. So first uh, I, I'm telling you that it's, uh, it's great to be here and um, I'm going to tell you about our, one of our adventures that is virtually anywhere in Second Life is a way to show you how 
uh, virtual worlds and transmedia storytelling can be used to teach language. I am honored to share our experiences here. And um, I want to thank BWEC and you all for having me here for listening to our story. And uh, in the next few minutes, I'll talk about my research and practice and in integrating transmedia and storytelling in virtual worlds to teach and learn English in my online classes and with my students. So thanks again, and I look forward to a great discussion after this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, let me get started by telling you about our project. Virtually Anywhere is a transmedia experience that uses storytelling to help students to uh, learn English. <laughs> Students collaborate to create new stories. I don't know if my speakeasy is working. Is it? Okay. Uh-huh, but I don't see it's changing. Oh, it goes slow. So, um, here we are. So, um, The storyline uh, used for this project is a part of an audio series by Cambridge Assessment English. And these uh, audio episodes were created to help students improve their English listening skills. So basically